Thank you very much for the invitation to join you um, and for the provocative title, Andrew. Um, I am going to be talking about why behaviour change is a better bet for tackling climate change than relying on speculative technology. And I'll also touch on carbon offsetting if there's time. Um, so the context to this really is that climate change is accelerating. So uh, in fact, the latest assessments show that we're likely to breach uh, the 1.5 degree safe warming limit uh, in the next few years. Of course, we're already living with many of these impacts. Developing countries are seeing the worst of the uh, worst of these impacts, but we're in the UK and in developing uh, developed countries seeing more and more impacts too. Last year, for example, was uh, the hottest year on record. We um, reached 40 degrees C uh, in the UK for the first time. And so we're gonna be seeing more and more of these, these impacts, um, really bringing home the idea that this is a climate crisis. This, this is an existential threat that we are facing. And so the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us that nothing short of societal transformation is required to tackle the climate crisis. This means systemic change, not incremental change across all sorts of systems from transport to energy to food and so on. We're not on track at the moment. Uh, we've managed to reduce emissions to some extent from our energy supply. Um, so we are shifting more to renewables uh, away from fossil fuels, but we've really hardly touched the demand side of our energy and resource systems. In other words, how we use energy and resources. This is really where the people side comes in and the behavior side uh, as well. Um, and because of this, we really do need to think much more about people and to bring people with us. So we need to engage the public in decision making about how we're going to reach our net zero or carbon targets, what that looks like, what the pathways are. But at least as important is actually engaging people in delivering that change, in, in changing their behaviour. And that's behaviour change across a, a lot of different areas. So we often think about behaviour change as consumers, so buying electric vehicles or heat pumps, for example, but we also need to change our behaviour and have the potential to shape climate action in lots of different ways, from how we invest our money, how we um, work with other people in our communities, what we do in the workplace and how we engage politically. Um, just looking at the scale of behaviour change then that we're talking about, it's clear that technology alone is not going to be enough to tackle climate change. That's clear from a number of assessments now. We're going to need pretty profound behaviour change as well. And this figure on the right comes from the Hot or Cool Institute's assessment of how much we're going to need to re reduce carbon footprints across different countries uh, in the next few years. And so you can see that the UK there has an average carbon footprint of eight and a half tonnes of CO2 per person. We need to get to two and a half tonnes by the end of this decade, in the next six and a bit years, if we are to stay within a 1.5 degree limit uh, of global warming. Um, and this is in the context of developing countries actually expanding, growing their carbon footprint. So we've got a real challenge here to, to radically rethink our behavior and our lifestyles. Now contrast that, the need to change behavior that's, that's quite well established now in the evidence base with how um, solutions to climate change are framed within the dominant policy discourses and, and the main mainstream climate policy in the UK and in many other countries. In the foreword to the UK's net zero strategy, our former prime minister says for years going green was bound up with a sense we have to sacrifice things. But this strategy shows that we can build back greener without so much as a hair shirt in sight. In 2050, we'll be driving cars, flying planes, heating our homes, but the cars will be electric, gliding silently around our cities. Our planes will be zero emission, allowing us to fly guilt free and so on and so on. Um, very clearly, a techno optimistic climate policy framing, the idea that, that we don't need to change our life, lifestyles and perhaps actually that, that doing so would, would be a sacrifice, this idea of a hair shirt explicitly mentioned. Is this realistic? I would say it's not realistic and a lot of assessments have shown this. So from the, the excellent Absolute Zero report that Cambridge uh, University put out a couple of years ago, 
they show that global demand for energy is rising. And while we have managed to made, make some inroads to our emissions in the UK, that's primarily by closing our industries and importing goods from elsewhere, not by actually uh, changing patterns of demand. And the focus on technologies to tackle climate change like carbon capture and storage, the idea that we can trap carbon emissions um, and store them uh, from the point at which they're released, they're at such an early stage of development that they won't reduce emissions significantly by 2050 because it takes many decades to roll out these sorts of technologies. Um, the CREDS uh, Center makes similar sorts of claims, say, saying the focus on carbon capture and storage and hydrogen in UK policy is uh, high risk uh, and, and with uncertain rewards, whereas we could focus much more on energy efficiency and tackling energy demand, which would be disproportionately effective. Those solutions are ready-made and they could have immediate benefits. And then most recently, the Climate Change Committee was very critical of the uh, Prime Minister's announcement of rolling back on net zero commitments, saying that this makes it much more difficult to actually tackle climate change. It increases, it increases delivery risks and removes flexibility in the way we can actually address climate change. So just focusing on technology, uh, those big technologies like carbon capture, they're not if going to be, they're not going to get us to net zero and certainly not in time, not by 2050. But apart from being not effective, they're not very, this is not a desirable approach in many senses. Now, this unreadable table comes from work done by IPCC authors in the latest assessment report. Um, and what they've done is they have mapped here, um, uh, uh, the rows represent different um, demand side strategies for tackling climate change. So everything from uh, reducing food waste to shared mobility to designing more compact cities to circular economy and so on. Um, and along the top, you've got lots of different um, dimensions of sustainability and well-being. So the sustainable development goals mapped across the top. On the far right hand side, you've got supply side approaches to tackling climate change. And what you will see is that the what blue means is the is the most positive impact. The darker blue means the most positive impacts on well-being from these different things, and the most the darker orange means the most negative impact. What this basically shows is that um, the demand side solutions to tackle climate change, uh, the things that tend to involve changing behaviour, for example. Uh, achieve a whole range of different well-being and sustainability benefits. Whereas there are far fewer and off, often negative um, impacts of only focusing on the so, sort of big supply side things like carbon capture. We can go further because actually we have also found um, that people that have higher, uh, sorry, lower carbon lifestyles tend to have higher subjective well-being. In other words, they, they report feeling happier, and more fulfilled with their life. What this tells us is that actually going green is not really about sacrifice. Um, it seems to be almost the opposite. Actually, it could improve our quality of life. So this is a complete contrast to what was said in the forward to the net zero strategy, that we, that we don't have to give things up and have a hair shirt to tackle climate change. Here, we're actually saying there's a huge opportunity to improve our quality of life if we do start to change behavior. And a final point, actually, is that, in fact, government inaction to tackle uh, climate change could even be undermining people's well-being. We know that climate change is uh, worry is very high across most countries and young people in particular are very worried. Uh, about 45 percent on average across a whole range of different countries say that their climate anxiety is impacting on their day to day functioning. And importantly, this study by colleagues at Bath showed that a perceived failure by governments to respond to the climate crisis was strongly associated with that distress, with, with um, climate anxiety. So people feel worse and more anxious thinking that actually the government is not doing enough to tackle climate change. Uh, so it's undermining well-being. And actually, you might say, well, the government is just worried about uh, people not wanting to change their lifestyles and that actually it's going to be very difficult to get people to agree to uh, some of these demand side 
uh, measures. Well, actually, again, the evidence doesn't bear that out because the polling that we've done with Ipsos Mori, we have found that across a whole range of different um, climate change policies that would have quite significant Im implications for our lifestyles, everything from frequent flyer levies, so this is where you would pay more tax for each flight you take per year, um, through to phasing out gas boilers, electric vehicle subsidies, creating low carbon neighbourhoods, enjoy majority support amongst the UK public. So we've got public backing for a lot of these net zero um, demand side policies as well. So this should should reassure policymakers. Um, I haven't really touched on carbon offsetting, but a lot of what I've said applies to carbon offsetting as well, that we don't reap those benefits. Um, and there is evidence of moral hazard. In other words, that actually focusing on carbon offsetting, paying somebody else basically to reduce our emissions, delays um, uh, actually reducing our own emissions. So if we just pay into a scheme to get someone else to do it, we put off or we don't actually bother to change our own behavior or change our businesses or organizations. So offsetting similarly uh, is, is not a strategy that you would want to rely on. So to sum up, radical social and behavioral change is essential for reaching net zero and incre uh, increasing our resilience to climate impacts. UK uh, climate policy at the moment focuses primarily on technological solutions to climate change, and it doesn't talk very much about addressing demand. This is unrealistic. Um, it, it's not going to get us to net zero in time. It misses opportunities to improve well-being in lots of different ways. Those, those so-called co-benefits of climate action are not achieved and fundamentally may even reduce our well-being because actually people feel more anxious thinking that these strategies are not sufficient. And yet reassuringly, the public does want more ambitious climate change action. They do want to change their, their lifestyles. They need support to do that, but they are in favor of many of the policies that would help them to do that. Um, and at that point, um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.